we're going to make uh, some films now about the bass, different aspects of playing the bass, and uh, I think we're going to start with bowing. And maybe the best way to start with the bow is to make a visit to Andrew McGill. He lives in the next village to us, and he's one of the finest bow makers in this country. Uh, he does violin, viola, cello bows, and restorations, but he specializes in bass bows. So uh, off we go to Andrew. Here we are. We're in the next village, as I said before. We're in the workshop of Andrew McGill, who's one of the finest bow makers we have in England. He makes violin, viola, and cello bows, but he specializes in double bass, which is very lucky for us because that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, since we're talking about bowing, we may as well talk about what a bow is, how it's made, where it came from. That would be a really great idea. So, Andrew, would you tell us a bit about how you would make a bow? Okay, well, uh, the very best bows, the finest bows, are all made generally of Pernambuco, although there are other woods. Now, uh, wait, what's Pernambuco? It com only comes from a particular area of the, is the west coast of Brazil? Brazil. Brazil. It's heavier than, heavier, it'll fl the sticks have to come on balsa rafts because it's so heavy, it'll just sink. It's also very hard to get hold of these days as well. Hmm. Pernambuco is, um, has many properties that are ideal for bow making. Um, it could be both rigid, but it could be bent, because if you heat it, it becomes flexible, so you can uh, mould it into any shape you like. Um, there are other woods, but they don't have the same qualities. So you've got a log of Pernambuco. Mm -hmm. You start with a board. We start with a log, which is then cut into boards like this. Okay. Uh, then you cut out uh, individual sticks into that kind of shape and then you plane it down slightly so it's slightly thinner more uh, workable uh, then you bend it so you heat it and the heat makes the wood flexible and uh, let me ask a question when you're bending it and when you get this far do you have an idea what you've got because with base making for example by the time you've car begun carving the front, you know exactly what you've got, and you may have to make it thicker, thinner, different things in order to make each individual piece of wood once, work. Once you've cut the individual sticks out, then you have a better idea of what's good and what's not, because some will be too soft, too flexible. Um, some will be dead, so if you ping them, there's no resonance in the stick. Yeah. Um, so you want a combination of strength and resonance. And one of the best ways is to, if you have a concrete floor or a slab floor is to, is to ping them on drop the floor, it, yeah. drop it, and you get like almost a glass effect. Yeah. So that, that's what you're looking for. In we sticks. do that with sound posts. Ah. Yeah. So then obviously you don't want faults in the stick either. So if it, if it has a fault in it, uh, then it's no good, depending on where the fault is. Um, Does it have to be quarter sawn, plank sawn, or quarter sawn? Yes. What you don't want is slab cut, which is um, straight down. So you could, the angle can't be any greater than 45 degrees. Obviously, when it, basically like that, slightly off, but no, no more than 45 degrees. Okay. Um, then, of course, you start planing it down, and that can affect the way the stick is. You can start planing it down. It may become too weak, then you have to discard it as well. And you plane it before you start bending it? Yes, slightly oversized, but uh, just thin enough that you can bend it. Obviously, with base bows, it's a lot harder to bend than it is a violin bow. So you take off just enough. So if, if the end measurement would be 10 millimetres, you'd make it 12 millimetres, roughly. So okay. it's, it's about 2 mil over what it's going to be. Then you bend it to a pattern. Um, I use a Sartori pattern, pattern mostly. Um, then when it's down to that size, you obviously start planing it down to in, in finer detail. Uh, you drill the end out. You do, you, do you start out making it into an octagon? Yeah, I start octagonal. Um, when I'm bending, because it also helps when you're bending. You bend it on this, you will see, put that in the vise, and you push against it to get a nice even bend when you, you bend it. You can see where it's well worn. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. if you do it, and if you just do it by hand, you tend to get like little V's instead of a, a smooth bend. Okay. So you bend it on that to get an even bend, and you bend it all the way along the stick until you get to where you want to be. And then when it's in that state, you, um, you drill out the end, uh, you make the nipple, and then you, uh, you find the octagonal down, just, just again, just over what you want it to be. So at the end of the stick is 12, you've got about 13 mil. And then you work back through the stick through that. So you, you come to a point there where you mark, and then you basically you round off the stick all the way along. Is there a, a mathematical pattern? 
because I know v -arm worked one out, didn't he? Some people make bows to an exact pattern, so they'll have, they'll have a measuring gauge and they'll measure the yeah. stick all the way along. I have a rough idea, because obviously if you take wood off, the wood will get weaker you're or just, more flexible. You're feeling. Because I noticed, I noticed my sartre, for example, some of those bows, vigneron, they can be even thinner here than they are here. Yeah. And some bows that yeah that defy that defy logic defy logic so it's it, I tend to do yeah. I follow patterns but I only do I go as I, you know, I work with it as I go along to see how it is basically because it can change also, every stick is different not one, not two are the same so you, yes you have a pattern but yes then you you adapt that's the beauty of working with wood isn't it no two anything's are the same and you've got this thing this thing that you're making something out of it's great. Once you've made the stick, that's that. This is bits. You leave that for now. Have you got one that's slightly bent? I've one that's slightly bent. Like that. So you get to that stage, really. There we go. Look at that. So that's that's a okay. Rough octagonal stick, rounded down. So you've started rounding shape. it here. Yeah. I noticed with Sartre, for example, he carries the octagon just beyond the grip. That can vary in different makers yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, I know. And yeah. I, I follow a vignon pattern as well. I don't make a stick completely round. I do a D section, so the bottom two lines I maintain, unless someone wants a particularly round stick. And the reason for that is to blend. Why would you make an octagonal stick? Because it gives the stick more strength. It gives it exactly. structure. Because yeah, yeah. each, each face is, is strength, isn't it? Yeah. So the idea of the vignon then is to combine so you still have the round, which can be more... Round, which is more flexible, flexible. but strength. But when you want the strength, especially around yeah. that area, it will, if you're doing that, say, you're... Because obviously if the string's there and you're playing on the string, you have control. But once you're up there, you want to be able to control it. I'm going to talk about exactly that when we start with bowing. Okay. Then you move on to the head. Um, so... This is a finished, nearly a finished one. But in case you can look at the head anyway. So once you've roughed out the stick, you shape the head. And again, that's a personal thing, but you can follow patterns. That's just one of mine. So once you've worked through the stick up to that point, you then shape the head. That's, you can see, it's distinctive. It's a McGill. Thank you. Absolutely. This hatchet, the nose there, it's fantastic. Beautiful, isn't it? Of course, tips used to, so the tip, this bit, used to be mainly ivory, but obviously you can't use that now. I use mammoth now. There are other things, there's um, resins, there's, um, you can use cattle bone tips, but I use mammoth. Mm. I remember when I was a young fella working in the workshop, we used to have to grind them down, the bone tips. What an amazing smell that is. Mm -hmm. Not good for you, yeah. <laughs> No, terrible. Because <laughs> we didn't know what was not good for us in those days. So once you've done the head, you come to the other end of the stick. So first of all, you have to make a frog. I love your grips. I think that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, you start, obviously, with a block of ebony. And you make a silver ferrule first. So obviously, you bend a silver piece of silver around. You solder it to the flat bottom. So obviously, you make this. once you've made this, you then go on with making the frog. So what you do, basically, you drill a hole through there, and you cut this section out. And then with a knife, you scrape back and you're trying to create that shape. So what you do basically is you fit that onto there. So once you've fitted that, you then work back through the, through the piece of ebony. So you create a, a, a gap there, which you put a slide into. You then round the heel off and put a, a heel plate on. And then you put the, you cut the underside to make the um, this. So eventually it looks like that. So you go from now, that. Does, to doesn't that. the heel plate hide something? Not necessarily. You can. You can, the slide, the, the pearl slide goes un, slightly under the, at that end. Uh -huh. But it's just, it's just, I mean, you don't even have to have one if you don't want one. Okay. Yeah, I know there's some inexpensive bows that don't have them. So you go from that to that, basically. Gosh. Lovely. Yeah, that's almost finished, isn't it? Yep. Or it is finished. Tell, what do you <coughs> think about balance and weight? You can have heavy sticks with the wrong balance. Again, heavy or light sticks with the wrong balance. So obviously, some players want it to be more on the string. Some players want it to be more just sitting there. And that's all about balance, not weight. I'm going to talk about that coming up. Yeah. But I know, again, all different sticks have different um, weights and balances. Because you get heavy, dense wood. 
which you know will, will affect the bass. But lighter, that I use not the light wood, but um, not very dense. It's not good, I don't think, for bass bones. Would you use heavier and more dense wood for, say, violin? Violin, yes. Yeah. And stronger sticks too, because obviously you just take a lot more off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So people, if people think, oh, a bass bow's got to be heavier wood, that's exactly backwards. No, I don't think that. I, yeah, I, I know. Like I agree too. Wood. Hmm. And of course, the lapping, once you've obviously made the frog, and of course you need a button as well on the end, the adjuster, which makes the frog go backwards and forwards. Once they're all done, then you, you know... Sa you said nipple before, and that's... we should point out that the nipple holds this in place. Yeah. So you've done the stick, you've done the head, you've made the frog, which you've fitted. So you're not working for a specific weight, you're working for the bow that you want and I make do. it work. Again, I do. Yeah. Again, base bows, I like to make around 135 grams, which I think is about the ideal weight. But some people want 140, some people want 130, but generally it's about 135. And again, it depends on the stick. If you've got a heavy piece of stick, obviously, the more you take... That's what off, I've always looked for. Actually. The more you take weight off yeah. a stick, the weaker the stick becomes. So it's all about getting the stick to feel right when you're making it. But then once you've made it, you can adjust the weight by this. So if you make a slightly thinner frog or a smaller okay. frog, or you use a three-piece button as put, or a solid button, yeah. and the lapis, that's a, that will weigh about one and a half to two grams. If you put all silver on, it's about six, six grams, six or seven grams. So okay. obviously that tips. So you're keeping the weight down. It tips the weight that way. Yeah. So, but you want it, basically you want it to sit like that in your hand when you're playing. Yeah. Or slightly on the string. So you... Then you're going to put hair in the bow. Yeah, once you've done all that, you... you do you finish off the stick? You. What do you finish with? Oil or? I use a combination. I start with a fine, like micro mesh. Yeah. Uh, then I oil. So I basically it's kind of not. It's not hot oil, but you put oil on it, and if you rub it fast enough, it will heat up, and it almost okay. seals it. It's, yeah, yeah. Then I've got. A, uh, I use violin polish, a layer of that or two. Uh, then wax to seal or finish. Or you can use French polish. Some people use French. I sometimes do like a light coating of that. So I put some on a cloth and rub. You make a tack rag. Same like thing, furnace. yeah. And it will yeah. basically kind of heat as you put it on. Mm -hmm. Just a thin layer. Yeah. So that's what once, once. So you've lapped it, you finished it off, then you that, hair it. That bows, what a pretty color that is. Thank you. <laughs> it's really nice. Great. What about width of, width of the frog and the tip? Uh, again, I use, uh, I tend to use vineyard on patterns as gauges so that's not quite as wide as sartory no no i don't like to i don't because you get obviously the wider the head to the i think it could be too too wide a spread yeah so i, I usually about 19 mil is mine is the thickness of my head and what is your ferrule it's about i'll measure it and tell you Because you want the hair band to be more or less consistent up the bow, do you? I'm just guessing. But it's slightly thicker towards the frog. The frog, okay. but only slightly. Mm -hmm. So that one's twenty, twenty-two and a half. Which means with the hair in, it's going to be twenty. But it's, so it's, it's only going to be about a mil difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What is hair? What? Where does hair come from? Um, what does it do? Sorry to bombard you with well, all these again, questions. Again, with bass bows, you get more kinds of hair than you do with violin bows, because violin, viola, yeah, cello, they generally just have the best Mongolian white hair. Yeah. People don't use anything else for those bows generally. And it's bleached? Not always, not always. Um, okay. But with bass hair, you've got different ones. You've got black hair, you've got mixed blonde, and there's variations of that too. You can come in greys and blondes. Should we grab one? I think that's the best hair, to be honest. I love that hair. It's just got the properties of both, because I've always thought white hair was finer. It is, yeah. And black hair was coarser. And this is in between. It's got a mixture in of both. In between, yeah, that, exactly. That's what I like about it. Yeah, and most people use this, yeah. or a variant And if it. you try mixing them, you've got a <clears> mixture <throat> of flexible and hard, Yeah, some people which mix, doesn't work. Mix white and black, which, yeah. which is, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, you've got yeah. two separate hairs doing two different things. This is naturally the way it is. Yeah, I really like that hair. As you know. Yes, I know. <laughs> Good. What makes the hair, what are the properties of the hair that make it good for stringed instruments? Well, hair has little, you can't, obviously, under the magnifying glass, you can see it's got little tiny grips on. Yeah. And that's so what, I'm going to talk about that later, too. So yeah. I thought we'd, we'd work that one in. So that's what 
They're microscopic, microscopic teeth, aren't teeth, they? Microscopic teeth, in effect, yes. We yeah. obviously pull on the string as it comes along, as it goes along. Yeah. And, and the rosin perks them up, does it? And again, different rosins do different things. So, uh -huh. like powdery rosin, sticky rosin, again, that can affect what hair you use and how it works in, con in conjunction with that. So, that affects that. So, that means a coarser hair probably could take a stickier-ish rosin? More of a powdery rosin, really. Really? Okay. But people who use white hair, I think, generally tend to use a sticky rosin. Because in effect, the white hair isn't doing a great deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you've got, if you've got coarse hair... See, they're making a balance between the, the grab and the rosin. Mm -hmm. Got you. Yeah. Good. Andrew, thank you very much for allowing us in your workshop. It's, been a it's great. Okay. <laughs>